to be together. Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus. You want to go with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, and I'm going to read from verse 5. And it says, When the disciples went to the other side, they forgot to take bread. Watch out, Jesus said to them, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So they, be, they began to discuss this among themselves, saying, Is this because we brought no bread? When Jesus learned of this, he said, You who have such little faith, why are you arguing among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not remember the five loaves and the five thousand? And how many baskets you took up? Or the seven loaves for the four thousand, and how many baskets you took up? How could you not understand that I was not speaking to you about bread, but beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then they understood that he had not told them to be on their guard against the yeast in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's amazing how even though the disciples were with Jesus, they missed so much. And we understand that these are uh, Jewish men grown up in a culture where the law has been everything to them. And they had been uh, controlled and governed by the, more the Pharisees than the, than the Sadducees. These were the two uh, there was one other sect at that time, Jewish sect, called the Essenes. But these were the three groups, the most prominent being the, the Pharisees. And what the Pharisees had become experts at was uh, not just upholding the Torah, which are the, the first five books of the Bible, the, the writings of Moses, but that was paramount to them, especially the book of Leviticus. These guys were absolute nitpickers when it came to the law. And they were so obsessed with the law that they began to add to it. And so they made laws about laws. So in order not to break a law, they would put up fences around that law, and those fences were just simply other laws. And this was their reasoning and their, and their logic. And obviously they held to the rest of the, the, the Old Testament scriptures, the Tanakh, but then they had the Talmud and their Jewish oral traditions and, and all these things. But you can understand, by the time Jesus comes, Jewish society is controlled by this, this mindset of laws and rules and regulations. And folks, I'm going to read a passage uh, of, of scripture to you because it's so ridiculous where they had in fact got themselves to. Now we know that when Jesus came, he has the greatest rebuke for this, this sect, doesn't he? Because he says to them, you on the outside like white tombstones, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. He told them they were a brood of vipers and of their father the devil. They laid upon others burdens that they themselves couldn't even carry. And the, the, the message that they preached never freed one person. It simply judged and condemned every person that was subject to it. Just go, go quickly to uh, Mark chapter 7. And I'll just read through this, this very quickly from verse 1. Now the Pharisees and some of the experts in the law who came from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. When they saw that some of Jesus' disciples ate bread with unclean hands, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they perform a ritual washing, holding fast to the tradition of the elders. Not the law, the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. They hold fast to many other traditions, washing of cups, pots, kettles, dining couches. You, you can see what kind of life are these people living? They're not free. They're always under these burdens, and they're always tormented by, you know, did I wash? Did I forget? You know, did I get it right? If, if I didn't wash, now I'm in trouble. You know, that kind of a tormented lifestyle. 
the Pharisees and the experts in the law in verse 5 asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders? But they eat with unwashed hands. He said to them, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In fact, that's a, that's a desperate thing, isn't it? They were so convinced that they were right with God. They were so self-righteous because of all these things that they were doing. Honoring God with their lips, but their hearts were, were far from Him. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Having no regard for the commandment of God, you hold fast to human tradition. He also said to them, you neatly reject the commandment of God in order, in order to set up your tradition. Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever insults his father or mother must be put to death. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, whatever help you would have received from me, it's a gift from God. I mean, honoring our parents is what we're called to do, right? These guys were telling their parents that it was a gift from God if they, if they did anything kind for their their parents. Hopefully none of the kids here think that today. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do many things like this. And then he called the crowd again and he said to them, listen to me, everyone and understand there is nothing outside of a person that can defile him by going into him. Rather it's what comes out of the person that defiles him. You see, folk, they had no regard for what was in the heart. Their whole obsession was about the outward appearance, getting everything right, dotting all the R's, crossing the T's, down to washing cups and dishes. All external stuff that never changed the heart of one person, ever. This was the gospel preached by the Pharisees. He said to them in verse 18, are you so foolish? Don't you understand that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him? It does not enter his heart, only his stomach, and then goes out into the sewer. He said what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the human heart, come evil ideas, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, evil, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evils are what come from within and they defile a, a person. Now, put yourself in that place as a Jew, just governed by all these things. Having these burdens put upon you that even the religious establishment cannot carry them and every time someone gets close to meeting some kind of standard that they've set, not the Word of God, they then create something more. So they just keep raising the, the bar. Whoever attains, whoever arrives, whoever gets made free, no one. And this is how the entire nation are living. And folks, understand, they're living like this also under the suppression of the Roman Empire. So what is the state of the average Jewish mind at this time? They're not living by faith, that's for sure. So when Jesus warns them about the yeast of the Pharisees, they get the whole message wrong. And they start thinking about natural bread. And they get confused. And Jesus says to them, don't you remember, even if I was talking about natural bread, what are you stressed about the fact that you went across and you forgot bread? Don't you remember the 4,000 that I fed? Don't you remember that time where, where I fed 5,000 men besides women and children from that kid's lunchbox where he bought two loaves and, or two fish and five loaves of, of bread? Have you forgotten? You see, folk, there's no faith in the hearts of these people because none of those things inspire faith. They will only bring us into a place of fear and guilt and condemnation. And so, when you consider this, this whole aspect of Jesus now warning the disciples against the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I think of scriptures, and I, 
I was just looking at Romans chapter, chapter 8. And if you want to go there quickly, Romans 8, just three verses. Jesus says, for all, in verse 14, who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. But doesn't the Bible say that salvation is for the Jews? Didn't Jesus come for the Jews? They were the ones who had the covenants. They were the ones who had the commandments. They were the ones who had the promises. We as Gentiles were alienated from that, were we not? We were strangers from the covenants of promise. We were without hope, and we were without God in this world. And so salvation was for the Jews. Jesus came for the Jews. But folk, the reality is this. They were the natural sons of God, were they not? Natural olive branches. And so Paul makes a statement, for all who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the, are the sons of God. Listen to what he says in verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery, leading again to fear. That was, that was exactly where the Jews were. They, they had a spirit of slavery. They were always slaves. They were always laboring. And, and folk, as hard as they worked, they were never, ever going to attain. They would never arrive. They would always be Slaves, And yet the teachings they had were, were teaching them that they were the sons of God. But it didn't work that faith within their, within their spirits. He says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery leading again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba Father. Isn't that an incredible thing? The spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that we are the children of God. Of God. I'm sure you also enjoy that song. No longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I, I love listening to that song because it just resonates and confirms in my spirit. That's who I am. But I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer having to carry this burden and this guilt and feeling that I'm never ever going to make anything and I'm never going to attain and, and I'll never arrive because I have the assurance that I'm in Christ. I'm a son of God. And if we're sons, then we're heirs, the scripture says. We're accepted in, in the beloved. The Bible tells us, as we now led by the Spirit of God, we are the sons of God. Romans 5 also teaches us that it's the Holy Spirit that sheds the love of God abroad in our, in our hearts. Either we led by love, or we led by fear. And I don't believe there's any, there's any middle ground. How are you serving Jesus this morning? Out of love or out of fear? How were the Pharisees serving God? And I'm not talking about the reverential fear of God, which is a good and a healthy fear. I'm talking about fear because I'm not going to arrive. I'm not good enough. I'm not going to be accepted. That kind of fear that brings guilt and condemnation. A fear that brings torment. Because the Bible tells us that, that fear torments us, doesn't it? But perfect love does what? It casts out all fear. And so they, what we believe shapes our thinking. How are you thinking this morning? And I'm, I'm genuinely asking us to examine our hearts. How do you live your life every day? What are the thoughts that occupy your mind on a daily basis? Are they thoughts of freedom or are they thoughts of fear? Are they thoughts of assurance or are they thoughts of rejection? You, you've got to examine your heart. I've got to examine my heart. And just like the Jews at that time, the Pharisees had put the Jewish community in this bondage by all their teachings... Folk, we can do exactly the same in the church of Jesus Christ. We can become nitpickers, right? And we can put pressure on people to conform. 
and, and folk, it becomes so ridiculous, we can, and, and God forbid that, that it happens here, but there was once a time in our history where we were even controlled in terms of what we dressed and how we dressed. That, that's how easy it happens. And we're more worried about the outside than upon, upon the heart. And that never frees people. It can never free people. It will only ever put people into guilt and condemnation. It will leave them in a place of fear. And if people try and do anything to meet that standard, it never frees them because they're doing it out of a sense of guilt, looking for acceptance. And folks, did the people ever find acceptance among the Pharisees? The Pharisees made sure that the people knew they were never good enough. And they were never going to be good enough. And so we can be there, right? Right? And just like these same Jews with that torment were under the oppression of the Romans, but we're also tormented by all the things that take place in our society. And so what are the thoughts that go through your mind every day? What are the things that are controlling you? And folk, we will ultimately behave out of that thought process. And isn't that where it's all at in terms of the teaching of Scripture? Where is spiritual warfare? Is spiritual warfare really, you know, walking around town anointing lampposts? Going on top of Signal Hill and binding and loosing and, you know, doing warfare and speaking and declaring into the heavenlies and all the crazy stuff that's going on. Like, it's an utter waste of time. The warfare that is going on is within our, our minds. In fact, either you've been fashioned in the church by the mind and the teaching and the doctrine of the Pharisees. Were you living according to rules and regulations and laws? Or we've been shaped by the teaching or the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing that when you, when you consider when Jesus came, folk, what a revolutionary he was. He comes into the midst of all this stuff. And he himself grew up as a Jew. He knew the law. And here he comes in, at, at 30 years of age, he begins his public ministry, and we understand why the religious establishment got so infuriated with Jesus Christ. Because he took the same laws that they knew, the same teachings that they knew. They were the commandments of God, and the way he taught them liberated and freed people. In fact, that infuriated the Pharisees, didn't it? It undermined their empire that they were building. It undermined the structures of that empire and their hierarchies. It undermined all those things. But I tell you what, people, for the first time, were being made free. And, and it wasn't the religious people that responded initially, but it was the people that were having to try and carry these dreadful burdens. And so Jesus goes to the same community, the outcasts, the drunks, the prostitutes, the riffraff, the tax collectors. And the message that the Pharisees preached did nothing for those people. But yet the message that Jesus preaches changes them completely. And people begin to come out of fear and into the love of God. And they come out of darkness and they come into light. And through that same message that Jesus preached, people's lives begin to change, radically change. In fact, you can imagine the threat to the religious establishment, especially when the apostle Paul, Saul at the time, who was their key man, he was the guy they were pinning everything on to crush and bring an end to the sect called Christians. And then Saul, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was the worst kind. He gets saved. And folk, the same doctrines he believed in, in the beginning, but without the traditions of men, without all the other stuff, he saw Jesus and all those, those things. This is the same Paul that's telling us today, folk, that you and I are no longer slaves to fear. Because we have the Spirit of the Son, God has given us, that makes us to be the sons of, of God. And what does Paul write to Timothy as a young man? He, he says to him, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a, 
of a sound mind. But your belief system, the way you and I behave, how are we serving God? If it's, if it's based on rules and regulations, we grip by fear. And the reality is, but we will never ever come into a place where we actually have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where many people are, stuck in religion, serving an institution, fearing men, worrying about the external, and never changing, even though they're ever learning. Isn't that in the Bible teach us about that? Ever learning, but yet never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And folk, what does the truth do? It makes you free. Don't you want to be free in Jesus this morning? I'm telling you, we need to be free. And it's the truth that makes us free. And so you look at the doctrine that Jesus came with. And the doctrine that he gave to the apostles... And we teach it today, it's called the Apostles' Doctrine. It's also called the first principles of the the doctrine of Christ. But folks, look at that foundation. And the scripture talks about repentance from dead works and faith towards God. It's the most liberating doctrine because our work, 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 isn't this what the Jews were doing? They were working for their salvation. They were working to better themselves. They were working to be accepted. They were always working, but they were never, ever free. They never got there. And then Jesus comes along and he says, stop working. Repent of working for your salvation. Quit it. Because you will never get there. I've paid the price. Folk, you know what a powerful message that is? Maybe not to you and I as Gentiles. Because we were just grafted in. But to the mind of a Jew tormented by the Pharisees, this is a powerful message. You mean I've got to, I can stop doing all this stuff. That was the message of Jesus. It was too simplistic, wasn't it? The Bible talks about the simplicity of the gospel. When you and I stop working to earn our salvation, only then can we have faith towards towards God. That's what Jesus was saying to these people. You stop working. You stop trying to keep these rules and regulations. You stop. Don't worry about washing your hands and all that external stuff and washing the pans and, and the couch you sit on. Repent of all that. Repent of trying to save yourself. Repent of your self-righteousness. Repent of all those works and put your faith in me. Trust that what I did upon the cross is sufficient to save you. And folk, was the cross of Calvary not a completed work? 100%. What can you and I add to what was done on the cross? Nothing. Jesus did it all. That's why he declared, it is finished. No longer did people have to be slaves. They could now be free. This is the doctrine of Christ. This is the doctrine that brings us into freedom. Brings us into the the love of God. And so we look at the the principle or the doctrines of baptisms the scripture says. So I stopped trying to save myself. I put my faith in Jesus to save me. And what does God do? He puts me into his son. He baptizes me into Jesus. And if any man be in Christ, what is he? He's a new creation. Old things passed away. Everything becomes new. Anyone had that experience? Don't ever go back to the old, folk. Don't ever think for a moment, having had that most glorious, miraculous experience, that you ever have to go and keep uh, some religious experience a rule or regulation again. We've got to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. These are the doctrines of God. You're in Christ, and in Him we have our freedom. In Him we have our security. In Him my sins are forgiven. In Him I attain to His righteousness. Do I have to keep the law? In Him the law is fulfilled. And so I have fulfilled the law. Isn't that an incredible thing? You've had that experience? Jesus says, right, here's what you do. Declare it. Get baptized in water. And so I stand there and I show the death. I go under the water and I show that I'm buried with Christ. I've died with him, I've buried with him, but I've been raised in the newness of of life. Powerful teaching, powerful doctrine. So so I reckon myself to be dead indeed to sin and alive unto, unto God. No more fear. No more guilt. No more condemnation. I'm a son of, I'm a son of God. 
And then, folk, you want to live like a son of God, you need the power of God's Spirit. And we need the continual infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives because without Him we can do, we can do nothing. And so thank God for the, the baptism of His Spirit. And folk, often we get to a place where we think we're okay and we don't need to be relying on God's Spirit every day. Folk, you cannot survive without the Spirit of God. We need His Spirit every day. How's your thinking? How are you living your life as a Christian? You're okay because you come to one or two meetings a week. Or you read your Bible or you tithe or all those, all those works that you do. And then, folks, here, here's the principle, the baptism into suffering. That unless you get this one, you'll always struggle in life because we're going to suffer, aren't we? And if we don't understand the purpose of that baptism, that it works good for us and not evil, then, folks, every time we go into a bit of difficulty, what are we going to do? We're going to think there's something wrong with us. We're going to go back to a gospel of works to try and fix, to try and make right. We're going to come back into guilt and fear and condemnation. Every single one of these doctrines of Christ free us. They liberate us, folk. That's what the truth does. It makes us free. And then that wonderful principle of the laying on of hands. Having now freely received, we freely give. You and I are not just members of an institution. We're members of the body of Christ. We're His hands. We're His feet. We're the ones who God is living in and working through. He is in us, folk, manifesting His life and His love through us. And so every believer, every one of us who have had this experience, everyone becomes a priest. In the Old Testament, it was only a few. Every single person is a priest. We all have a part to, to play. The resurrection of the dead. Isn't that our hope? This is where the Pharisees and the Sadducees differed. The Pharisees believed in a resurrection, but really that wasn't their hope. Their, their, their hope and everything they were banking on was in this life. Being someone, being prominent, having a position, making and generating wealth and climbing the religious establishment's ladder. That was where the hope was. Sadducees didn't believe that there was a resurrection. But folk, for you and I, it doesn't matter who we are in this life. We know that we are going to rise from, from the dead. And so we have an incredible hope, don't we? What, these things should shape our, our thinking. And then we know one day we're going to stand before God because he is the judge. Jesus is the judge. And so there's an eternal judgment. But go with me to one last passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. So then if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. And all things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Folk, whatever gift you have, you know, whether you have one of the five gifts or whether it's acts of mercy or kindness or generosity or hospitality or showing acts of mercy, whatever it is, it's all couched in this one gift that is given to every single believer in Jesus. And what every one of us have first is the ministry of reconciliation. We have one real overarching purpose, folk, in this world, and that's to reconcile men back to, to God. You know, I may have the gift of a teacher, but it's got to be couched in this ministry of reconciliation. Otherwise, I'm just going to take doctrine, and I'm going to preach doctrine at people, and I'm going to become a nitpicker and try and get everyone to follow every single item in Scripture even to the point of what my preferences may be. But if it's not reconciling them to God, I'm wasting my time. Amen? So if you're a teacher, it's got to be with a view of teaching doctrine to bring people into relationship with Jesus. Otherwise, you've missed it completely. Whatever other gift you have, if, if you have a heart for showing acts of kindness, which some people do, Look, if you're just involved in acts of kindness, you're going to be another Mother Teresa. 
You're going to be kind to everyone, but they're all still going to help. What's the point? But if it's acts of kindness couched in the ministry of reconciliation, then every act of kindness you do, it's with the view of reconciling people back to God. Whatever gift we have has got to be couched in this ministry. Otherwise, I tell you what, folk, we're wasting our time. It's all about reconciliation. We have one primary purpose. Are you reconciling men back to God? Folk, how, how am I functioning in my ministry? Have I become a Pharisee? Where I'm just heaping condemnation and guilt upon people? trying to get them to conform to my rules and my regulations and trying to get everything so neatly packaged so that I can say, well, look, look at me, I'm a great teacher. But no one's been reconciled to God. God forbid that that should happen. But that's exactly the trap that the Pharisees fell into. And folks, I believe it's a trap that many are falling into today in the church. And so he says in... Uh, Verse 19, in other words, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. That was what Jesus came for. God was in him, and he was reconciling. Jesus had the ministry of reconciliation. And folk, when you look at the life of Christ, that was his focus. He knew the law, but did he use the law against the people, or did he use it to free the people? Because the Pharisees brought a woman to Jesus one day who had been caught in the very act of adultery. They caught her in the bed with a guy. And they dragged her out and they brought her and, and, and there she is groveling in the dust of the earth while these religious fanatics, these self-righteous people are standing over her with the law saying to Jesus, this woman should be stoned to death. And that was what the Lord demanded. And they were right but they didn't have the ministry of reconciliation. They, their only obsession was trying to uphold a law. Jesus knew that law, folk. But this is the love of God. God is love. And with a heart filled with love and the ministry of reconciliation, Jesus looks at this woman and there's no doubt that he has compassion. And so he says to the accusers, all right, that's what the law teaches. So what the law also teaches is only a sinless person can stone her. Whoever's without sin, stone her to death. She's yours. And what happened? They all began to leave. And who was left? The one who could have stoned her to death. Jesus Christ, the sinless lamb of God. And what did he say to that woman? Go, but sin no more. Folk, her life was radically changed. We see that in the life of Mary when she came into Simon Peter's house and began to weep on the feet of Jesus, washed his feet, dried his feet, anointed him. And the Pharisees are condemning her. They're condemning Jesus. That woman left forgiven that day. Did it change her life? Did Jesus send her off with a, rule, a packet of rules and regulations? And you, you better do this, and you better do that. No, folk, there was such a radical impact that happened in her life. That's the same Mary that went back and told Martha and Lazarus, you've got to come meet a man. That whole family came to faith in Jesus. And they shared an intimacy with Jesus Christ. We know that. Jesus loved them. Folk, we've got to trust God. Only God can change the hearts of men and women. And if people don't change, folk, to think that we can impose things upon them and become strong-armed strong armed in, in, in our preaching to change people, we're deceived. We become like Pharisees. When Jesus touches the heart, the heart changes. Amen? And we've got to have every confidence in the word that we preach because he goes on to say this, that he was not counting the people's trespasses against them. That was the problem with the Pharisees. They held the people's trespasses against them. And Craig preached last week about that very thing. If your brother sins against you, how we hold things against each other. Where in fact we should be swift to go to our brother. To what? To reckon. So. In fact, there, there, there are always going to be things. 
But what are we? Have we become the judges of one another? Are we the ones who are holding their trespasses against them? Or are we freeing people? Then he says this, and he has given to us the message or the word of reconciliation. Look, that's what we have. We have a message, not just the ministry, but we have the message of reconciliation. And I want to encourage us this morning. But we've got to be living as the sons of God free. And I'm not saying this morning that we're not going to uphold sound doctrine. We've got to stick to sound doctrine, but we've got to stick to the teachings of Jesus. Not our man-made traditions and our preferences and how we would like things to be. Folk, that's irrelevant. Let's just stick to the doctrine of Christ which brings people into relationship with Him. Because who is that foundation? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, there is only one foundation that can be laid, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. And folk, I want to tell you, I'll guarantee you 100% this morning, if you and I are built on those teachings, we will be free. But we will be in, because we would have reconciled with Jesus, who is that, that foundation. And folk, if that's my foundation, and that's your foundation, then we're on the right foundation to reconcile men with, with God. Because I tell you what, there's a seriously broken world out there that are in desperate need of Jesus Christ. And the world don't need a Pharisee. They need, as he says here in verse 20, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. You're not an ambassador for the Howick Family Fellowship. You're not an ambassador for some institution. You're not an ambassador for a man. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. As though God were making his plea through us, we plead with you on Christ's Christ behalf, Christ behalf, be reconciled to God. But God, I don't know what we've been doing, but I'll tell you what, we've got to get back to this foundation, to this truth, where you and I become obsessed with reconciling men back to God. Amen. Lord.